from Poland, Christ uh, Christoph Opasiak. He's going to talk about capturing audio and video from uh, a board farm. And in this case, I see that he has prepared a Raspberry Pi set. So without further ado, I give you Christoph. Okay, so. Sorry for, sorry for the delay. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, there will be no demo um, because the FOSDEM box which records the video crashed my laptop or the other way around, I don't know, uh, for now. So we will go only with slides and if you are interested then after the talk uh, you can come. I will connect my laptop and show the demo on a smaller screen. Okay, so let's start. First of all, the, the schedule. Uh, in the beginning I will tell a few words uh, what people are using the board farm for, uh, what are the typical setups available in the open source community, uh, and then I will go to the HDMI Pi, which is my proof of concept of how to grab uh, audio and video on a board farm, how to use it for testing your uh, audio and video subsystem. Uh, I will also tell a few words about future work, so this solution is only proof of concept. Uh, it's not something that you can use as a product, as a, some, something stable, so it requires some future work. Maybe some of you will be interested and pick up the, the idea uh, and have some resources to work on that. Uh, okay, so generally what does it mean a board farm? A board farm is a set of boards. When I say board, I mean things like single boards, computer like Raspberry Pis or droids, etc mobile phones, TVs. Generally at Samsung we are manufacturing a lot of different devices and all of those devices require testing. So to test them we need to, to put them somehow together and automate the tests. And this is the first use case because running a board farm is nothing cheap. You need a lot of hardware, you need a lot of software, but in the end you need a lot of maintenance and this is the biggest problem. So, if you would like to test your stuff on the real hardware, you need to somehow automate this. Of course, you may always try to hire uh, some load-paid people to do this manually. You may try to use an uh, emulator, but sooner or later you will notice that this doesn't scale. And if you have a lot of products, if you have a lot of software, it will be a bottleneck for you. The other use case is sharing the hardware. Unfortunately, not all boards are like Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is really cheap. You can buy it everywhere. But there are some boards which are, which are dedicated for AI. There are some boards which are really expensive. So it's not always possible to get as many boards as you have, as many developers you have. So this makes a board a shared resource. So we have to somehow share this board between developers. When they are sitting next to each other, it's pretty uh, straightforward, you can always borrow the board, but still you, need, you may need to reconnect a lot of cables and reconfigure a lot of stuff in your environment. But the problem starts when you've got the distributed team and your team should share a single hardware. For example, Samsung has an office in Korea, in Poland, in USA, so that way the, the people who work on the same uh, topic could share the same hardware um, uh, all around the clock. So there are many challenges if you'd like to build a board farm. First of all is that every board is unique. So if you are using Raspberry Pi it has a different format, different connectors than the BeagleBone. If you are using a TV board it has much different connectors. If you are using refrigerator because it's also one, one of Samsung products it has also very different ports. So you somehow need to control that board. You need a method how to flash it. And you need a method how to do a power cycle, etc. Because every board is unique, you need to somehow unify the access. And it's not an easy task. Um, one of the biggest challenges is my maintenance. Generally, uh, things, it turned out that running a board farm is mostly a maintenance and fixing hardware problems. Uh, the, another issue is stability and scalability. There are some solutions, but they often do not scale uh, to, to be big enough to meet our needs. So what are the typical setups available in the open source community? Well, the first of them, and probably the, the most known, is the LAVA, which stands for Linear Automated Validation Architecture. 
So basically, Lava contain, uh, consists of two elements. The first one is the Lava Scheduler or Lava Master, and the, uh, another one is Lava Dispatcher. So Lava Master is a server which provides you a single API which you can use to schedule your jobs. Jobs are described using YAML job description. Uh, and then you've got the Lava Dispatcher, uh, who has a real hardware connected uh, to it and can put your kernel, put your uh, system image on the device and execute your tests. So basically, to, usually, to, to connect the board to the Lava Dispatcher, you connect multiple boards to a single Lava Dispatcher. To do this, you use some power relays, probably some cheap USB power relays, then you use some serial adapters, you use USB hub, some Ethernet switch. Generally, it all depends on your board capabilities. The typical tests uh, in, in terms of Lava architecture uh, consist of downloading the image because you, you may need to flash something after you build it. Uh, you need to flash it to the dude, uh, then you need to boot the dude, and then you need to run some kind of test script and collect the results. So it's pretty straightforward, but still you need to, sound, you need to know how to flash uh, the dude, how to get inside the dude, uh, what to do to access it, what to do to push files or to download files, etc. So there is, it's not easy to create your own uh, Lava setup. That's why uh, Patrick Tatian and Kevin Hillman came with a concept of Lava in a box. Uh, basically, it puts all the elements required to create the Lava uh, laboratory in a single box on a single computer. Uh, it consists of PCKs, power de delivery unit, and in terms of software, it runs both Lava Master and Dispatcher in separate containers. So you can always try to scale this and put Master on separate node and add another dispatchers. Um, they use uh, some serials, ACME, ACME board. Uh, which are used to measure and control the power. Uh, they have USB hub control and uh, Ethernet switch to, to connect the boards. But still, it's the same approach uh, as we see generic in, generally in Lava, which contains a um, single controller for multiple devices under tests. And we decided that we should go with a different design because that design has certain problems. For example, if something happens with your USB subsystem, and this is the case very often, all the boards which are connected to the same Lava Dispatcher are getting uh, unusable. Which means that you've got downtime not only on a single board which caused the, the problem, but you've got downtime on all, the on all the other boards. Not to mention that if you would like to fix this, you may need to interact with the communication to the other boards. So for example, if some people from other corner of the world are using one of the boards connected, and another one is not working, what you should do? Should you wait until they, they will end? Well, how you should reboot the machine? You need to somehow reallocate all the boards. So this creates a lot of problems. That's why we went with a design that we've got a single device under test controller, uh, which is over here. It's our own custom-made MOOCSPY board based on NanoPy, uh, and only single target connected to it. This target may be very different. You may use mobile phone, raspberries, Android, etc. The goal of the MOOCSPY is to provide a unified access to any device under the test. But when you've got thousands of those devices, or at least tens of them, you, still, you will run to the problem that you somehow need to assign them to the engineers or to maybe to uh, some automated testing system, etc. So you need something to, to manage the access. And this is our demon, Boruta, uh, who does this. So it allows you to allocate a board for a cer certain period of time. Uh, it can be done both by the developer, it can be done by the, some automatic system, by like Jenkins or like our own well Veles. But just allocating a board may sometimes be not enough. When you allocate, the, when you would like to run automated tests, you need somehow some, some kind of test manager. That's why we developed also Veles, which is a test manager almost compatible with Lava. So it takes the, the same job, job description. Uh, it uses Boruta to allocate the board, downloads the image, flash it, and execute all the steps de defined in tests. So what MOOCSPY really is? 
So it's our, our custom-made extension board for NanoPi Neo, uh, which allows you to control the power of the device under the test. It's provide, it provides SD card uh, demultiplexer. Why? Because we are running also bootloader tests. If your bootloader gets broken, it may be hard to recover your board. You cannot do any TFT boot, anything like that. So you need a really good method to recover your target in an automated way. And this is what we use SD card the multiplexer. So we may decide whether the micro SD card from which uh, the Raspberry Pi is booting should be connected to the Raspberry or to internal micro SD card reader. Then we've got diapers because some of our targets uh, require uh, a button press to be booted. Uh, we've got serial connector uh, for accessing serial console, uh, USB serial switch because our mobile phones have a serial, con serial connection on the USB port, uh, power measure measurement, so it includes also the Acme boards, which I mentioned earlier, uh, a small display uh, for convenience to, to show the IP address or some status info, things like that, uh, RGB diodes for the same purpose, and the important thing is that the, the MOOCSPY itself is extendable by design. So it provides an extension port, there is extension board format, so if you need any, any other connector that is not already on the board, you may design your own add-on and go on with that. We tried that, for example, for neural language processing, uh, natural language processing, uh, we designed a board which is uh, a speaker and a microphone and allows you to, to make some uh, AI tests and thing, things like that. We've got also remote controller for, for the TV. Generally, you can design anything you, you need and put this uh, on the MOOCSPY. The last feature which is here is ADID injector. Uh, generally, some boards are not very happy to, to boot without the display connected. So that's why we provide a method to uh, inject the, HD, the ADID information over the HDMI port that you may see here in the bottom. Those are all the various other connectors and the black one are the extension connectors. And this HDID is nothing more than I, I square C uh, communication which just injects uh, the information from the NanoPi Neo to, to the device under the test. So the board thinks it has a monitor connected and starts providing uh, the video output. There is just no one on the other side who is uh, listening for, for the video signal. Thanks to this, we you can do, for example, a screenshot because board thinks that it has a monitor, so it provides the output. But if you would like to do a real testing, uh, a real te test real stuff, or for example, you would like to test uh, application which use hardware overlay uh, to, to play a video or stuff like that, uh, you need somehow cap you need some way to, to capture the HDMI output. Not only make a screenshot, not only record a movie by entering the target and making uh, a screenshot every every 10 milliseconds or things like this you need the real video output. That's why I created uh, this proof of concept. And the first question is, why not use a dedicated hardware? Generally, HDMI grabbers are available in the market, so you may go to the shop and ju ju just buy them. The problem is that a single HDMI grabber may cost around $300, and it often causes a high CPU load on your machine, which in terms of the MOOCSPY, uh, and the NanoPi, which, which is there, is uh, very hard to, to make it work smoothly. And many of them require USB 3.0 communication, which is also unavailable uh, on, on the, on the MOOCSPI and the NanoPi especially. And still, even if you provide the stream via USB, you would need to somehow encode it and send it over the network because we would like to have a remote access to, to, to that stream. So fortunately, I went to FOSDEM this year, and there was a guy from Intel who told me about this awesome HDMI extender. So what, what does it mean, HDMI extender? Uh, HDMI extender is a device which is used by, uh, by shops with TVs, where you can provide a single HDMI output and then play the same content on, on multiple TVs. 
And the thing is that the whole, the whole uh, output from the HDMI is, is streamed as MP MPG uh, over the UDP multicast. So you can easily grab it, for example, with VLC. <laughs> so, and the thing is that the cost of such a device is $30. So it's ten, 10 times cheaper. So how is the, the demo here, which is not, which is, uh, not possible to, to show connected? First of all, you've got the MOOCSPY board over here. Uh, there is a NanoPy. And to MOOCSPY, there is a device under test connected. We can uh, use the power relay to control the power of that board. We've got our device under test, which is in Raspberry Pi in that case. And it has an HDMI connected to this HDMI extender which is connected uh, via the Ethernet to the MOOCSPY and to, to the NanoPy internally. And it, we can also control the power of the grabber using diapers, and we can control the quality of the image. We can switch from uh, 70, 720p to full HD. Mm, another connection is uh, from NanoPy to the device under the test, because when you are able to see the output from the board, you, you may need to also send some kind of input. So for example, you may need to emulate keystrokes or maybe some mouse movements, things like that. So that's why we use NanoPy to emulate uh, human, uh, human interface devices and provide input to the device under test. So this is how it looks on a bigger picture, all the connectors, etc. So generally, the audio and the video. Uh, the grabber provides MPEG stream using UDP multicast. Uh, by default, it has an IP address as on the slide. And the default multicast group is also here. So all you need is just to, is just to connect uh, this to your computer and open uh, VLC and start grabbing uh, the video from the board. Uh, the thing is that the VLC par uh, parameter, is, oh, the stream can be captured not only with VLC, but also with FMPG and many others. The thing is that VLC parameters really matter. Uh, there is um, a trade-off be between the delay and uh, the stability of the image. The less delay you have, the less uh, stable the image is going to be. So you have to find the right, the right parameter for you. And the thing is that VLC version really matters. Uh, if you use unsuitable version, let's call it, then the stream is going to crash multiple times, show glitches, etc. But if you go with quite recent version of the VLC, it's pretty fine. Uh, the thing is that the NanoPy uh, kernel version also matters. If you use too old kernel, you will get a really bad performance. But if you use too new kernel, then you will get a lot of UDP stream crashes. Uh, because there is some kind of bug in the UDP streaming and you will get a really bad video. Okay, so solution. If you would like to just make a screenshot or recall, record a video on the NanoPy, you go and simply use FFmpeg or VLC, grab it, save to the disk, you're fine. But if you would like to stream this to some remote computer, some remote machine, then you need to somehow put it from one network interface to another one. The easiest solution for that is to use SOCAT. But the thing is that it causes high CPU load and increase the delay because you have to go through the user space. So that's why we should try to make uh, some kernel side solution. So for example, you can use SMC root and IP tables because what you need is uh, not only uh, pass the messages from one interface to another one, but you also need to change at least the source of the message. Uh, because you may have a different IP address, etc. You, may, you, may, you should send this to, to, to your sender and stuff like that. And the issue here is that I, I was unable to change the destination of that IP frames. So if anyone has a good idea how to modify multicast traffic inside the kernel to uh, override the multicast group, uh, of that traffic, I'm really open for contributions or suggestions how, how to do that. Uh, I tried obviously IP tables, uh, multiple uh, tables, mangling, etc., uh, but it didn't work. 
So versions, because versions are important, like, like I mentioned. I use VLC version 3.0.3, and this is the one which works pretty well. Uh, in terms of params, I use network caching 200 and clock jitter 0. The NanoPy kernel version, which is working, is uh, 4.11.2, and the SMC is 2.0. When you've got the video stream working, then you may need to provide some input. To do this, I configure a NanoPi as a USB uh, keyboard and the mouse. Generally, NanoPi is equipped with USB device controller, so it may act as any random USB device uh, using ConfigFS. So this is a script which sets up two, uh, a USB device with two interfaces. Uh, both of them uh, belong to the human interface class and first of them is used to emulate a keyboard and the second one is used to emulate a mouse or to be more precise a touch screen and I will tell why a touch screen not a mouse uh, in a few minutes. So keyboard, how do you emulate a keyboard? Generally when you execute that script you will get two new device nodes. It will be dev hit G0 and dev hit G1. To send some keystrokes to the device under the test, you simply execute write to those device nodes. So to, in order to, to send the descriptor, you need to prepare, prepare a special message. This special, special message in terms of keyboard consists of uh, two parts. First of them is the modifier keys, and the second one are the key pressed. So for example, Please note that this is the least significant bit. So for example, you've got Control, Shift, Alt, GUI, and the, the ping on the right side of the keyboard. So in this case, you notify the device under the test that user pressed left, Shift, then the, there is a placeholder, and then there is a key code which is already also pressed. So in this, uh, this message, informs the device under the test that the user uh, on that keyboard pressed uh, the quotation mark because we've got shift and that key. So this is relatively simple. But now the mouse. The thing is that uh, tracing mouse movements may cause a, uh, a lot of network traffic. So to reduce the amount of, of the messages sent to the device under the test, uh, we are just emulating a touch screen. Why? Because that way we don't need to trace the mouse movements. We are just sending the descriptors when, when we click a mouse. So to emulate uh, a touch screen, you also write um, a specially crafted payload to the dev hit G1 on the NanoPi. Uh, the first byte is the number of fingers, which are currently uh, touching the screen, usually it is one. Then you've got the finger ID, which is just some kind of unique ID. Then you've got state. You've got basically two states. One is the, the, the finger is touching and the second one, the finger is released. And then you've got the X and I position. So generally I put all this stuff into one single application, which is very simple. Uh, it is written using Qt library. It's like, I would say I didn't use anything, anything special from the Qt, it was just, okay, it's easy framework, I know it, let's go. I use QSSH uh, to inject commands to the NanoPy and for example to write those uh, descriptors. Uh, I used also QSSH for forward, forwarding human input, so the application trace what user is doing on his computer and then provides the same input to the device under the test. And then I use QVLC uh, to, to display the video content. And this is a, a time for a demo, but un unfortunately it's not working. So after the talk, uh, you can come. I will show this on my laptop. Uh, so generally what I managed to, to build is a kind of hardware equivalent of remote desktop protocol. So the, the thing is that the device under test is totally agentless. So you are, not in, in, you are not providing any modifications to the image you are testing. You are just testing the real hardware outputs. And that's the benefit. Unfortunately, uh, even though it has benefit, it has a couple of issues. Uh, first of all, you cannot track the mouse. Well, you could, but it generates a lot of traffic. 
So we need to find a dedicated daemon to, to pass that, that input over the network. Uh, the stuff I mentioned with in kernel multicast to unicast con con conversion. And the delay, well, it's not zero. Let's face it. It's usable, but it's not zero. It could be much better. Another issue is the video quality. Like I mentioned, depending on the version of the VLC you use or uh, depending on the kernel version, you may get uh, very different outputs and very different qualities in terms of, st especially in terms of stability. So how, what can we do to, to improve this? Well, generally the, those issues uh, are related to the HDMI extender itself. Um, because it's not a very clean MPEG stream. When you try to grab this MPEG stream, you get a lot of errors from VLC, etc., that it is unable to parse some, some part of the streams or some part of the streams are getting out of sync. Yes. <laughs> I will show you uh, on my laptop. Especially if you use the older versions of the VLC, the 2. Dot something generates a huge error log uh, on your console. Uh, so that's why it's better to, to use the newer one. Um, still, it's hard to tweak the stream parameters to, to get it working in a way we would like to uh, make it working. And there is no way to tweak the compression parameters on the device itself. It doesn't provide any API or special buttons or something. So it's simply a black box. It, if it has any issues, we are still unable to fix it. There are some tries to reverse engineer it. Uh, there are some other versions of the, of the firmware. But if you flash a bad firmware, uh, you are on your own and you have to desolder uh, the memory and reprogram it with SPI. So it's not very convenient. So that's why I, I started investigating and I found an awesome project call, called Team Videos or HDMI to USB. Uh, it's a board designed by guys from Australia and it has been designed to record the conferences. They are using this board to record, for example, Linux Conf AU or uh, some number of Debian conferences all over the world. And the board is really powerful. It is open hardware. It has an FPGA on, on, on the board and it provides a number of HDMI inputs and HDMI outputs. So it is able to do man in the middle on, on the HDMI. It has also display port input. Uh, it can mix the streams and provides the output via Ethernet or USB. So it's really nice. But the thing is that it's very expensive. Well, it is expensive mostly because of the very powerful FPGA. If you need to mix number of uh, input videos and provide number of mm, input uh, video outputs, then you need to do a lot of computation uh, on that. The thing is that what we really need is just single HDMI output. So what we could do is to minimize the set of functionality provided by this board and make an equivalent of this HDMI extender. The good thing about that board and about the FPGA, FPGA firmware is that it is not written in VHDL or any language specific to the hardware. It is written in Python. There is an awesome library called Migen, which is used to generate FPGA uh, bit streams. Moreover, there is, a thing like, there is something called little x which is a set of pre-built, pre-prepared uh, modules using the, uh, which you can use inside the Migen. So for example, the HDMI, uh, bit the HDMI input parsing is ready out of the box. It is a separate Python class. You can just take it and deploy uh, by providing some, some very thin layer uh, on any FPGA you like. So if you didn't hear about that, I really encourage you to try. So what could we do with that uh, Numato board and Team Videos project? We can, first of all, uh, get that board and reduce the FPGA uh, bit stream to only to the functionalities which we need, which means single HDMI input and only single Ethernet output. That way, we would get the equivalent of that device. But we could also manage that device and provide any uh, compression parameters, any compression codecs that we need. 
And in the end, obviously, we, we need to redesign the board to reduce the cost, because th this is the, the biggest issue. If we would need a single board like this one, it's not a problem to buy it. But if you would like to test number of devices, we would need to buy number of those boards. And it, this is getting really expensive. So summing up, creating a board farm is challenging. It may provide uh, certain benefits, but still you need to manage it. And the maintenance of, of, of the farm is really a problem. Uh, there are basically in, a, uh, in the world different approaches. We choose a uh, single device under test to single controller because we think this is uh, better in terms of uh, maintenance cost. And this cheap HDMI extender can be used, useful for grabbing videos, but it has some issues. If you are able to, to fix them, please contribute. Uh, there is a GitHub, this is only a proof of concept. There's nothing stable which you can use as a product. But I really encourage you to try play with this one or to tr try uh, play with Team Videos project and maybe provide, come up with some uh, a open hardware HDMI grabber. It would be really welcomed. Okay, so now it's time for questions, if there are any. Go on. Oh, maybe microphone. So, do we have questions in the audience? Yes. Yep. Um, great talk. It was really, a lot of things were really interesting. Uh, when you mentioned about the NanoPi kernel version, uh, you pointed out one particular kernel that was uh, 4.11 something. Yeah. So, can you share some details? Is this a mainline kernel? Are there any patches on top of it? Uh, well, th this is a kernel I, I took from, from the GitHub. Uh, this board is manufactured by Friendly Arm, so there is a couple of patches, but it's not far away fr from mainline, I think. It's like two or three patches, simply. No, no, nothing, no big changes, I would say. Are these patches related to the... Uh... No. Oh, okay. No. The, the thing is that... Um, on the older kernel, everything is working fine, but the performance is not really good. The delay is bigger and you get more uh, glitches, I would say, because this is UDP stream. UDP stream does not provide you any kind of integrity like you've got in TCP, etc. When you say the older kernel, what do you mean? Because for Owinner and the NanoPies with Owinner, uh, we have these uh, old Linux Sunxi kernel that are triple. No, 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 it's not an that older, one. older mainline kernel. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And on the newer kernel version, uh, there is some kind of, of bug uh, in the network subsystem that you are not getting a stable uh, video on this UDP stream, but you get a lot of glitches. So for example, you get only half of the image and then the, the frame is destroyed. Okay, so any other questions? Okay, guys, unless you have any other questions for Christophe, let's give him a round of applause. Okay, so this is the end of the talk. If someone is interested uh, in the demo, you can come and I, I will show you how it works.